Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Future Construct podcast. I am your host, Amy Peck. And today we will be talking to Johnny Fortune, who is the BIM Program Director at the National Institute of Building Sciences. Welcome, Johnny. Thank you, Amy. Very pleased to be here. So first of all, would it be okay if I used your last name occasionally? Because I think your name, like the last name Fortune, I think I just, it's the best name ever. (laughs) Well, I I get that a lot. So sure, you can... uh... (laughs) And interjected where appropriate. Fantastic. So before we kind of, uh, you're, you know, you're working on so many different things and you, and you have a great purview from, from, from where you sit at Nibs, but I, I'd like to also just talk about, you know, how did you get into this industry? Was it a family affair or is it just something that you loved? Yeah, sure. I, I actually grew up in a construction family, a uh, small construction family. So even as uh, as a teenager, you know, I was always around the job site, uh, sometimes working on the weekends, obviously working during the summer. And so I've just really been around construction all my life. And then at some point when I entered into uh, the adulthood, uh, I wanted to start working on the design side. Um and start developing the design as opposed to just constructing. And so I worked the last 20 years in, uh, in the design community. And, uh, throughout that just saw a lot of, um, a lot of inefficiencies in the industry as, uh, many, many know has been well reported. The low productivity in the construction industry, uh, has been an ongoing problem. And so, you know, just embraced, that problem and and started looking for different ways to bring about improvements, getting involved in different initiatives. And it's kind of what led me to uh, the work that I've done over the past decade in terms of helping to write standards to improve processes and bring about efficiencies and productivity to the design and construction industry. So let's start with what do you attribute the kind of slow adoption rates and, and the inefficiencies to um, because it's not lack of standards. It's what, you know, that's what you're working on. So what are some of the challenges that come? Is it just like, it's just such a, a behemoth of an industry that it's hard to get it to change direction? It is. And we we have here in the U.S., we have very, um, we don't have one agency, that a government agency that's responsible for um, public design of public buildings and construction of public buildings. We have a lot of agencies. So it's, it's, it is quite complicated. We have a lot of different project types from residential to commercial. We, it's not like the automotive industry where we can easily just take it and put it into a, you know, a large warehouse and standardize on every piece and create a production line. That's even though that's been envisioned for the construction industry and offsite construction, there are some pieces that are, that are productivity enhancing to offsite construction. It is a behemoth of an industry that is fast moving. Uh, it is often a very litigious industry. Uh, some of the contract types for the industry are, are really not uh, developed to a point that that in, in, uh, encourages collaboration and encourages and rewards uh, productivity. So I think there's multiple factors. I don't think we can pinpoint one of those. I think there's there's the challenges of working with so many different owner types, so many different project types, so many different authorities that have jurisdiction that is not centralized. And then as as technology has has evolved over the past 20 years and it's evolved rather rapidly, there are the standards that help define define using that technology has always lagged behind and so it's it's very difficult to get um to realize the efficiency the productivity gains uh that are that are promised through through many of the applications and technologies that we've seen at the market and and since you've been focused on standards what are some of the standards that you've seen you know kind of come about and enacted in in the past let's say decade that you think have been really, really impactful? And and how do we rinse and repeat? Yeah, I think one of the most impactful uh, standards was ISO 19650. It's an international standard. Uh, it was uh, a lot of that work of uh, that standard was developed uh, in the UK. And again, that is a little, that's a different uh, governmental structure. They do have a centralized uh, group that really handles uh, the the 
the construction, the design and construction of, of public, uh, publicly funded properties. And so I think that's been very impactful. I think it's got the attention of the world. And I think here in the U.S., we're looking at that standard and saying, well, how can we, you know, how can we create an annex or how can we create a mapping? Because we use the different terminology. We use, you know, we, we have different processes, but but there's certainly some uh, there's certainly some advantages to trying to be able to adopt that. And I think that's that's one of the key pieces we're working on going forward is how do we adopt that? How do we integrate that into into our U.S. economy and our complex design and construction industry here? And then what, what are some of the standards that are that that the industry is kind of you know longing for that? You know, we're just in process. I mean, it's a long process to get standards ratified. Is that correct? Can you walk us through that, just sort of a high level of what that process is? And then maybe let's talk about what, what's coming. Sure. So, so that process is typically a, a three to five year process. So in, it's inherent in that in the traditional nature of developing standards that they always run, run behind uh, in terms of the emerging technology. So the standards are always... You know, trying to catch up with what what is being done in practice, we do have uh, a fair amount of standards that's been developed that are around information exchange and and data and defining what those data requirements are. Uh, but the biggest need and the thing that I've heard over the last decade, uh, going to speaking at a lot of conferences, talking to a lot of people in the industry, you know, the biggest need uh, is still seems to be on the practitioner end. Uh, practitioners have this, you know, they have this desire. They want to be able to open up a standard and, and read it and, and immediately plug it into their their day to day processes. And unfortunately, I think that is a piece that is missing. A very practical guideline to to implementing BIM. You know, what does digital twin mean for them? How are they making the the transition from traditional uh, design and documentation and handover to more advanced digital uh, transformative handover and, and documentation. And so those that's where the rubber meets the road it is the the you know the people doing the work. I, I still feel that they they don't have quite the guidance and the tools and the ease of use um, to be able to apply it day to day. Is and that is that down to training? So some of it is uh, is training, some of it's education, some of it is that there are gaps, uh, there are holes in the standards that exist today. Even though we do have a lot of standards, we've got a lot of organizations that have worked to develop some standards. It's it does seem as though that the practitioner and the the, the practical guidance on how to implement uh, it seems to be missing. And then, you know, you're focused on BIM. Why is there not broader adoption on BIM? I, mean, I think I asked this question to everyone, but I mean, it just, it seems a little obvious that th this would be much more efficient. And yet it seems challenging to, to kind of bring it into some work environments. Well, I think the key um, stakeholder for, for success for any project uh, is, is obviously the owner. They have the most uh, to gain. They 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 have the capital expenses that they're putting forth for any given project. They bear the most risk of any stakeholder, and and they are, uh, you know, that they are experiencing the most information deficit. So even though the the BIM has been adopted on multiple levels, it's been adopted by a lot of um, AEs. It's been a lot adopted by a lot of GCs and, and trades folks. Uh, ultimately, owners in general as a whole are not necessarily driving uh, the adoption of BIM and whatever the owner says in their requirements, that's what, you know, that's what the, the project teams and the construction teams are, are going to deliver. Uh, so we've not seen broad adoption um, from owners. We, we do have exemplaries that, you know, have, have gone all in and wants to be disruptive you know, in their in their own process and push technology and adopt BIM and digital twin. But for the most part, uh, the majority of owners have, have simply not adopted it. And I would say it really goes back to, I don't know that we've done a great job as an industry uh, as a whole, really communicating the value to the owner. We, we've, we've done a lot of communicating about value to the design team. We've done a lot of communicating about value to it during construction. Uh, but when we think about the, you know, the capital expense of any given project, it's, 
it's generally reported that it's 10, less than 10% of the total cost of ownership. So the piece we've really not tapped into very well uh, across across the nation and world is really to communicate this high level of value uh, that comes with having good data for the owner for the total cost of ownership so they can use throughout the life cycle of their of any given project. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the economics of that are incredibly important and strong. Uh, I want to come back to that, but we're going to take a, a little momentary break and we're going to hear from our sponsors and we will be right back. All right. Welcome back to the Future Construct podcast. We are speaking with Johnny Fortune from uh, National Institute of Building Sciences. And we're talking a little bit about standards and digital twin. Um, you know, the elephant in the room for the last, you know, little over a year uh, has been Meta changing their, uh, or Facebook changing their name to Meta. And, you know, I, I think in one regard, it's interesting that the AEC industry, you know, maybe some are interested, some aren't that interested because it doesn't seem relevant. But, you know, I, I like to think of you know the the metaverse for business as being digital twin and and all the functionality that can kind of be hung on a functioning model of a building and a smart building. Then you mentioned building lifecycle management, um, but are people drawing a line from you know BIM to building the as built to digital twin smart building to smart cities to ultimately the AR cloud, which is arguably a digital twin of the entire planet? Is that on the roadmap for standards and are people thinking about it now? I think there's probably a few people that are thinking about it. They are trying to draw those uh, connection lines uh, right now. I think there's a lot of effort in trying to draw a connection between BIM and Digital Twin. You know, it's interesting that that when you say Digital Twin, that that is, that is still for a lot of people an, an undefined concept and idea and they're still you know, there's still some debate about a good definition for that. And then ultimately, you're right, you know, having those in place, having good data leads to, you know, being able to to adequately populate the metaverse and, you know, smart cities and beyond. So I think there are visionaries uh, in our industry. There are visionaries uh, in in technology that, that see this as uh, it is imminent. And uh, they're trying to get out in front of it. They're participating in, uh, in, in work groups, trying to help to define what that is and try to help connect the dots and draw the lines. From, you know, from my perspective as, as you know, working on this, this national BIM program, and their digital twin is, is intertwined in that as well. My, you know, my perspective is that we, we are still lacking the good fundamental data that makes all of this happen and available and we we the whole premise behind the national bim program was that we realized there was uh that we're not really operating under a, a common open standards and so a lot of content that is created a lot of data that is created as it's passed off from one stakeholder to another you know some of that information may be dropped or lost uh, some of that information may be coupled to a particular application or program, and then and then so it doesn't translate or convert out of one program and into another. And uh, so, at, at the fundamental core, we we don't have the we're not operating on the the same level of open standards that the information that is created, the data that we transition into information and to share that information is fully interoperable is correct <laughs> able to transfer from one stakeholder to another and then ultimately feed into you know what we what we envision would be you know a metaverse or an AR cloud and are you getting as granular as you know from the standards perspective as file formats and and you know how to move you know one 3d asset you know to to another you know realm let's say from you know augmented reality to virtual reality are you looking at any of that or do you feel like that's a little bit beyond the pale for what your remit is yeah we're not we're not looking at applications as much as uh, and, and not looking at applications and tools as much as we are looking at uh yeah. ultimately when the work is done in this application or tool can it be fully exported or communicated or transferred out of this application and maintain its full fidelity 
and to be able to do that it it has it has to operate on a on a you know, on a basic consistent and open standard very much like you know cell phones regardless of our carrier <laughs> they operate on a standard that allows us to make calls to each other yeah that makes sense that makes sense and then in terms of just your own interest in the industry obviously you're very passionate about the industry what are some of the technologies that you think are having the most impact and and you know do you, do you think it's a, a sort of a slow burn for for adoption with some of these technologies yeah i mean cloud technology is is obviously uh, a key aspect uh, to be able to handle the amount of data that that we need to um, we need to mine we need to process and and then make available and make usable um, to facilitate business uh, process and decision making, that amount of data is is without question. It it happens, you know, in a cloud environment. All of those activities happen in a cloud environment. So I would say cloud advancements in cloud is is key. You know, I think a a, a very important aspect of that is is being, you know, responsible with with that technology as it is emerging, so that it maintains uh, security. It protects the data, uh, people's information, and information about their buildings or facilities is is not put at risk. So there is there is that balance always going forward of pushing for innovation, but also doing so responsibly. Uh, that that we maintain, you know, security uh, of that information. And then you know you, you, we talked you talked touched on uh, you know kind of building life cycle management. How important is you know, AI going to be into that, you know, you know, moving in the future on, you know, kind of closed loop optimization and monitoring systems, like, you know, what are some of the things that you're seeing in that arena? So I think AI is very important. I think it'll play an important role as it continues to develop and and as there's more adoption of uh, of AI in in the building industry. So I see it not only in design, you know, and in, in helping to uh, iterate through and find the best layout, as well as as construction. You know, identifying beforehand uh, safety issues or or other issues that that it may capture. Uh, but in in facilities management, I also see that uh, that AI is going to play a, you know a very important role in when when that facility or those who are running that facility need to make changes, move people around, uh, evaluate their assets. AI could play an important role to to help guide those decision makers. Ultimately, you know, I, AI I see is 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 an important role in facilitating those who are making the decisions, making the best decisions possible. And what advice would you give to owners now? Because you know, I I I I feel for people in this position because there is just this barrage of technology kind of coming. And you know the economics, uh, you know, are 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 so are so slim, especially during the construction phase. And you know, one mistake can can you know result in millions of additional cost. But what advice would you give to owners in terms of how to really navigate all of the technology that that comes down? Certainly, standards would be number one. But what what are some of the other things that you would advise owners to start really paying attention to? I would suggest play the long game. You know, realize it is it is uh, it's not just about the capex, the, the you know the capital expense at the for front end of any given project. Uh, think about you know how the decisions made um, during the design and construction, even though some of them may be at times more costly decisions. How that's going to impact the the total cost of ownership for that given facility or campus or or group of uh, buildings. Uh, so think about the long game, but I would also say that, um, and this is a key aspect of the BIM program that that we've launched at the National Institute of Building Sciences, is there's a, there's an entire focus group uh, on owner leadership where we're trying to build a a community of owners that can share their case studies with each with other owners, share guidance and suggestions with other owners. So I would say other owners who have already been on the front end of this innovation curve. Uh, they're the early adopters. Many of them have worked through some of these challenges, and I would say get involved with other owners. Um, the National BIM program is an excellent place to plug into that, 
and uh, you know hear from other owners what they're doing, what challenges that they've overcome and and they faced and overcome, and then how they did that. And so, you know, I don't work to have all the answers, or you know, even even our groups and committees don't. We, we realize that the best answer is really going to come from you know the collective fault uh, of of an entire community. And so we're building that community of owners get involved. Uh, don't, you know, I would suggest avoid, you know, just jumping from one application to another or one service to another. That's where it does get very expensive. Uh, so, so plan that out like you would any other aspect of your business, uh, your due diligence and plan out those pieces and, and play for the long game. I think that's, that is great advice. And I would urge anyone to, uh, to reach out. I hope, I, I assume they can find all this information on your website, uh, so I think I think that's a, a great solution, and I think that's uh, the, the knowledge sharing is really really important, especially now because there's just uh, a barrage coming at us from all sides. So let's shift gears. I, I'm going to ask you the question that I ask everyone. Uh, so imagine yourself 20, 25 years in the future, and you can bring with you any product, service, gadget that just makes your life better or easier just makes you personally happy what would it be and what would it do uh i think it would my mind might be rather simple but i think it would be you know some uh very intelligent contact lenses you know i've seen like these you know the headsets and the other pieces and you know to, to a degree you know wearable technology is is trying to evolve and you know i would love to and i wear contact lenses every day i would love for them to be smart like I would love to be able to put in a pair of contact lenses and and them be connected, them be able to provide data about something that I'm looking at. It would be on demand. Uh, so maybe with you know hand motion in front of in front of whatever direction I'm looking at, I could bring up information about a digital asset, uh, you know whatever it is, or I could, you know I could uh, I could tap into a a larger and broader uh data set to give me more information and it would have a super zoom feature like i mean it would oh, yeah. you know so like if i'm out like listening to the birds or whatever and there's one that's way away i could completely zoom way in without needing binoculars or any other yeah so i, I super I super duper contact lens i don't know how it would work you know it seems physically impossible but no no uh, no i i love that and you're going to get your wish in in early form well before uh, 20 years from now because there's a company called mojo vision doing exactly that i'll send you some information <laughs> oh wow interesting <laughs> well johnny it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you today thank you for sharing your insights with us thank you so much for having me i really appreciate the opportunity to to share in this message and and Tell people about the program. Would encourage folks to stop by our website and get involved. Excellent.